Good afternoon. No, no, not Easter. There we go. Let's do the first one. For number one there. Okay, thank you. And which one is it? This one, okay. Hi. All right, I'm so glad to be here with you today. No weddings, no counseling. All right. Whew. Thank you for uh, great testimonies, encouraging to me. Uh, I told Midori this morning, boy, the, the difficulties we've gone through this week must mean God really wants this message heard, preached, taught. And, you know, I, I, as I prepared, I told my little... Uh, Oh, I told my son the other day, I said, as I'm preparing this message, I'm, I'm repenting the whole time. So it's, good, it's a good word. It's, it's one of the key chapters in the Bible. And, uh, but I, before I start teaching, preaching, uh, I have a question for you. Are any of you, just, uh, can you lower it a little bit? A little bit too loud for, a little bit too loud. I'm, I'm, I'm in my ear. So, all right. Any, any of you impatient and have a hard time waiting. Anybody? Anybody? I don't see any hands going up. Okay, okay. Two, two, hand, two honest people out there anyway. Yeah. All right. Well, today's message might connect with you. We're going to do an overview of Isaiah 40, which actually begins <clears throat> the second section of Isaiah. Isaiah's uh, written in three sections and this will begin the second section of the book of Isaiah so to unpack this chapter though I'm gonna start in you know the scripture you have in your Bible is just the beginning where as I said I'm gonna do an overview of the a chapter um, but to unpack it correctly I think I'm gonna start with the end and go back to the beginning it's kind of like a Quentin Tarantino movie but without all the blood and gore right and cursing. yeah that's right <laughs> so the final verse of this chapter will actually give us some framework for understanding this important chapter of Isaiah Isaiah 40 ends with one of the most popular verses in the Christian faith and in the Christian culture, I should say. If you have a mother or a grandmother who is a Christian, she probably has this verse on a mug, on a framed picture, or on a poster somewhere in her house. Uh, my friend has, he said his grandmother has this verse on the bathroom door, so when he sits on the, you know, to do his business, there it is in his face. So let's, let's look at this verse but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles they will run and not grow weary they will walk and not be faint the very Word of God and we've got a lot more to read those who hope in the Lord now the root phrase for hope in is the Hebrew word kava. Kava. Let's see if I got it up here. Yeah. Kava or kava. We would say it that way probably. Keep this word in mind today as we run through or walk through this chapter. It means endure, as you can see, remain, wait. And that's why some of uh, translations we might be more familiar with, some of the older ones, translate it to say, uh, those who wait on the Lord. Those who hope in the Lord are those who wait on the Lord. One of the first Christian kind of songs I learned. Though they wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That one, yeah. So because it probably came from the King James or one of those but let me just confess to you I'm not good at waiting I don't like to wait at the 7-eleven 
I'm looking, the minute I walk in, I'm looking to see who's waiting at the register, where the 7-Eleven person is that can get to the other register, because when I'm done, I want her to be there. When I go with my wife to the grocery stores, I'm checking the carts. I'm checking the carts to see who has the least amount of things in their cart, because I don't want to get some behind somebody with a full cart. I can see some of, some of you are tracking with me. And I do it in my car. I drive 42 kilometers either to here, to come here, or to my wedding ministry work. Both ways are 42 kilometers, a little bit different direction. But, you know, I hit a lot of signals, a lot of red lights on the way. And before, when I can see way up there when the red light's changing, and I'm seeing cars stopping, I'm trying to figure out which lane to get in so I won't be get, get behind somebody that's going to make me wait. I check the model car to see. If it's a, an old slow beater, I don't get behind it. Now, it's kind of funny and cute to talk about this, but for me, this kind of time-limiting behavior in my life has unfortunately worked its way into my soul. Hoping in God, waiting on the Lord, is one of the biggest struggles I deal with on a daily basis. And this is what it does to me. It causes me to force my way into thinking I know what's best for my life. And so I begin to think I'm in control and that I can dictate the outcome and, you know, I know what's best for me, and I know when I should be getting it. And that's what I begin to think. And, you know, it makes it difficult for me to trust God in the most stressful unknowns of our life. And, you know, it usually happens with something that's really close to me. My walk with the Lord, my son who's in... Uh, just graduated from Duke University and you know, on our relationship with him or uh, things at work maybe somebody here or maybe somebody who will listen to this online later is in the middle of a situation where you have a deep need to hope in and wait on the Lord but we're struggling to do that aren't we we feel like our, we're in our own version of exile. All right? You ever feel like you're in like the children of Israel? I'm, I've been exiled. I'm, I'm away from the things I like. I'm away from my God. It's, we feel that way. We feel distant. We feel separated from God because of our circumstances. It could be that a strained relationship with a family member is causing this. It never seems to go well. No matter how much you pray, no matter how hard you work on it, you get the church to pray, it's still not going well. Maybe it's a health issue. Midori and I were just told yesterday of a, a dear friend who's got a health thing going on and it's just really a struggle. Maybe it's an, a work situation for you that just seems so unfair. It's not right. It's not going right. They're against me. I know they are. And they probably are. Or, with many of us, it's the unsaved people in our family who just will not come to Christ. And actually, the more time goes by, the further they seem to move away from the truth. You get them to come to church and they move further away. And here's a big problem for us today, right now, where we are in this world, in this generation, in this time, in 2018, in a culture that has conditioned us to get what we want when we want it you know this thing this thing Amazon what's what's the other one it starts Rakuten yeah that's ours you know and I don't even remember it but in a culture that's conditioned us to get everything what we want when we want it as quickly as we want it Amazon Prime baby right two days right but the answer that we get though Seriously, the answer we get to our confusion and our pain and our frustration when we come to church is 
Wait. Yeah. Wait. <sighs> right? Now let me say this. I'm, I'm a, you know, I, one of the reasons I, I love Pastor Chris's message because he doesn't, he doesn't play with one verse. He tells you what's before and after that one verse. And that's how he was taught in Bible school and that's what I was taught too. We, we take the passage. We don't isolate a verse and build a truth on it. And so what we fail to do so often in the church though is we read great texts like Isaiah 40, 31 and we fail to take to heart verse 30. All right? Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. We must not miss this. This tells us that in life, in our walk with God, we're going to grow tired. We're going to get weary. We're going to struggle. We're going to stumble. We're going to fall and bust our teeth on something. No one is exempt, except Pastor Hiroshi. No, it's not true. No. Everybody. Everybody. This is talking about everybody. So how do we wait on God as we walk through our own trials and circumstances? Well, as I said earlier, the second part of Isaiah begins here in chapter 40. And I believe, I really believe we can find help from God here. And I've been studying since the last couple of months of last year, the book of Isaiah. And as I've studied chapters 1 through 39, I found some amazing and beautiful promises from God. And I encourage you to study Isaiah on your own. It's a, it's a hard, difficult book. I, I called Chris once and said, man, it's wearing me out. The judgment here is so tough. But there's also, you know, there's some beautiful promises there, but there's that consistent theme of judgment being spoken over Israel and Judah. Chapter after chapter after chapter we see Isaiah you know, warning his people, warning God's people about what will happen if they continue to walk in the opposite direction of their God. And it's repeated over and over. This theme is repeated over and over. You have a choice. You can change your ways but if you don't, you can expect to be punished. You can expect to be judged. This is a repeated theme through Isaiah chapter 1 through 39. Over and over. Poor Isaiah is going and saying, God, don't make me say that again. Now, let me make this very clear. And God makes it very clear in these chapters that he would rather bless obedience than punish disobedience. Are you hearing me? God makes it very clear through His love and His mercy and His grace that He would rather bless obe obedience than punish disobedience. And you have to hurt with Isaiah and if you read Jeremiah, the same thing, you gotta hurt with these guys. It was Isaiah's job or his calling to tell God's people just how far away from God they were in every possible way in their lives. Now these people you know, I, I just went through and quickly tried to make a list of what they were doing wrong and willfully doing this stuff. They were oppressing the poor. They were involved in slavery. They were involved in economic repression. They were pushing down the poor and, and you know, just stuffing the money in their pockets, which means they were greedy. They were guilty of racial prejudice sexual impurity, I mean, beyond the pale. And the grossest one of all, which, which really got God angry, was the child sacrifice. They were guilty of that as well. You can read about these things in First and Second Kings, especially Second Kings, but Israel had gotten so far away from God that their own perception of their power. We don't need God. We can do this the way we want. Look, we're, we're, we're going to make it work. Their, their idea of how powerful they were 
without God had corrupted them. They didn't think they needed God anymore. Their, their minds had, had gotten darkened. They felt distant from God. And their hearts, their hearts became like stone. It was so hard for Isaiah to reach them. So, and God saw this. And God commanded Isaiah at the end of chapter 39. He directs Isaiah to go and approach King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good, pretty good king. Right? God had mercy on Hezekiah. He gave him an extra 15 years to live. And, but Isaiah went and said to him, I got some really, really bad but inevitable news for you, King Hezekiah. Everything, not some things, everything in Jerusalem and Judah will be carried off into captivity. Everything and everyone that you, King Hezekiah, value will be exiled to this new powerful little kingdom called Babylon. And guess what happened? It happened just as I, exactly as Isaiah said it would. In 586 BC, Babylon took Judah and Jerusalem cap captive. This Babylonian army completely leveled Jerusalem. They totally dismantled Solomon's beautiful temple. Just as Isaiah had said. The temple was no more. Jerusalem was no more. Israel was gone. Now listen. Suddenly, in chapter 40, the message changes. The message switches. Now we're going to begin reading. Now, I'm not going to go slowly through all of these verses but I'm gonna pick up some points here and there and eventually get to see what what is God is what God is doing here but let me read Isaiah chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 at least and we'll talk about that okay Isaiah chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 comfort Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Your sins have been paid for. Your sins have been paid for. Now, let me talk about this word comfort in these verse, this first verse here. I, had some, I have some friends uh, around the world who've lost someone close to them in the last few days and weeks. And the communication as these people were getting ready to pass, or one of them had passed suddenly, but the communication we've exchanged during that time has been please Pastor Kevin pray for comfort pray for comfort now with uh, Mr. Mimura uh, Yuko's husband we prayed for comfort for him and for others we praying but you know some of these people that I've been in communication with their their family members were already saved right and Mr. Mimura came to Christ so you know what greater comfort there would be to, to pass into glory and meet Jesus face to face that would be comfort that would be the ultimate comfort and you know God is saying to Isaiah comfort my people comfort my people this is the same God that I've been praying to for the past few weeks for my friends who have lost people um, you know who have People who are not well in their family. Can you pray for us to have some kind of comfort? The same God in Isaiah, and it's the same God that Paul spoke of in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me read from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3. Now nobody knew, I believe, nobody knew the Old Testament in Isaiah better than Paul. 
And I think Paul was having Isaiah chapter 40 in mind when he wrote this to the church of Corinth in chapter 1. He said, verse 3, he says it nine times in just two or three verses here. I'm not going to read all of that, but he said, Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we, were, we ourselves have received from God. This is the same God in Isaiah, in you know, 50 AD when Paul wrote, 40 AD when Paul wrote this to the church at Corinth, the same God that we can pray to today. Let's move on to verses 3 through 5. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, Every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mountain, uh, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I love this. Now, a Jewish reader in that day, in the day that Isaiah was wrote, written, would have known, probably would have known exactly what Isaiah was talking about here. God is bigger, God is better, and more powerful than the Babylonians that captured them. Now how do we get that from those three verses? It comes from verse 3 and the word highway the word highway. Now, you have to understand some history here. The Babylonians were the great builders of highways and skyscrapers in their day. Now, probably the first skyscraper was built by the Babylonians, but more than that, the highway. And one of their highways is legendary. It's, it was called the Processional Way. And it, had, it ran right through the center of Babylon. This highway screamed, our king has power and our king has authority. He has the a power and authority to make travel swift and safe and awesome for all who travel here. So, and then these grand buildings on either side of the highway would have made, would have just struck awe and fear and terror into the people traveling along this processional way in Babylon. So when Isaiah wrote about this highway in chapter 3, this would have caused the Israelite refugees to remember their captivity, to remember when that day when they were brought into Babylon, you know, the first time they were captive. They went down this road and they're going, whoa, whoa, this is frightening and awesome and they would have remembered that but then this is what I think happened and this is why Isaiah wrote it and why God, God had Isaiah say it in chapter 40 I think their fear would have turned to faith as they continued to read these three verses that we just read and this is why verse 3 says a highway for our God, right? God's highway makes the processional way look like a footpath in the countryside. Amen. I trap pigs. I go up in the mountains and you know what I look for? I look for kemono michi. A kemono michi, kemono is an animal. Michi is a road. And it's a little tiny path that you can see going through the, the, the woods. And that's where I set traps near those because that's where the, the pigs and the uh, tanuki and all that, they travel along that regularly. Well, this super highway in Babylon is kind of like a kemono michi compared to God's highway. Let me tell you why. Isaiah says that God 
doesn't build a bridge over a valley. What does he do? He fills in the valley. That's God. He takes care of it that way. God doesn't construct something to go over a steep mountain like we do here, right? In Japan, you go through these mountain roads, you go over all the mountains. God doesn't mess with that. He just levels the mountain. That's God. He levels the whole mountain. He fills in the valley. God completely wipes the barrier away. Not even the great empire of Babylon can do this. Only God can do this. Only our God can do this. Now, in verses 3 through 5 alone, Isaiah is saying that God will knock down every barrier and remove any resistance to get, that gets in the way of him getting to his people. Nothing's going to get between God's people and God. God will remove every resistance. God, and this is talking about salvation and redemption. God has come to save, He's come to rescue, He's come to redeem, and He's not only, not, He could do just that and it would be enough, but it says, He's also come to comfort us. That's how much He loves us. This is our God. Let's move to verses 6 through 8. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? Boy, Pastor Chris and I, you know, I gotta preach this, study. God, what shall I preach? And it says, all people are like grass, and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Let's see, where was I going to read? I'm kind of lost here. Yeah, that's where we're going to stop. Let me tell you just a little bit. Some of you are my friends on Facebook, and you can see I, I like taking pictures. And uh, um, I post a few there once in a while. When I first started digital photography, I had some friends in England who were kind of leading me along. I'd taken film, I'd done film before, and the guys who develop your film kind of boost your, camp, your pictures up so they look good, and you'll keep bringing them film to develop. But, but when I was doing digital pictures and I would post them on these photo sites with these guys who would, were supposed to be helping me uh, improve my digital photography, they would look at my pictures, and, and this is the, the comment they would say to me. They would say, Kevin, you framed it pretty good, but the colors don't pop. They don't pop. They use that word pop. Right? They're not vivid. There's not the right light. There's not enough whites. And it's not rich enough. And I'd go, pop? What are you talking about? And, and I found out that this is a word that artists use and, and photographers who are good use this word to explain something that's alive and, and vivid and, and full of something, right? That's, that makes you attracted to it. God is the artist and His Word stands out in the middle of all that withers, right? Look at these things that are withering in these verses we just read. God's eternal promises pop in the middle of all that is temporary. When something withers, it loses all its color. It loses its vividness, its life. Everything else is dull in light of God's promises. God told Isaiah to remind his people that they are in him and that they belong to the powerful and incredible creator and in him is life in the midst of death in the midst of hope in the midst of, of hopelessness in the midst of despair but you have to be in in him we pop we have color we are vivid this is interesting and we can't miss this. L listen to this next point. God says, tell the people they are like grass. They are temporary. 
You don't even have to be a Christian to understand this, to know this, right? You don't have to believe the Bible at all. Every human being will not outlast or outlive mortality, right? We're all going to wither and die. The best athletes will eventually deal with bad joints. Right, Pastor Chris? Mm. The most beautiful supermodels will not be on uh, Sports Illustrated covers when they're 80. Sorry. You give me a vivid picture there. The richest C CEO in Silicon Valley will succumb to his frail, sick body and die. Steve Jobs. But this is not true of God. This is not true of God. God and His Word endure forever. And th this, is, this is just so amazing what God does here. The amazing thing that we people, we humans, I mean, we have something over the grass. Even though we are temporary like the grass, God has set eternity in the hearts of every human being. Every human heart, there's a little bit of eternity. So unlike anything else in creation, we have the ability to think beyond our circumstances. And we have the ability to look beyond our temporary state and trust in God's ultimate victory in eternity, if we choose to. My, my dog Jazz, we just had sur he had surgery three weeks ago. And, you know, before he had surgery, he was just trembling on the table and he said, Dad, don't worry. If I die on the operating table, I'm going to be with Jesus. He didn't say that. He didn't think about eternity. He's just an old dog, you know. And I mean, we love him and we hope he's going to be with Jesus. He's a border collie, so, you know, I mean, he's going to be the great shepherd's dog, I think. But, but the, you know, we have eternity in our heart. We can trust in the God that it, Isaiah speaks, out, speaks about through this text. Israel is getting reminder after reminder of, of God's power and the depth of His power and who He is, who He's always been. And we're going to read on. And from now, from through verse 26, I think I'm just going to let the text preach itself. It's so good. I'm going to start in verse 9 and go through verse 26. Let's try that. You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. Now, I, I said I wasn't going to say anything. I was going to let it preach. But here is your God. That's just setting the stage to, for us to get to verse 31. Please keep that in mind. Here is your God. This is a picture of your God. See the sovereign Lord comes with power and he rules with a mighty arm. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young, those that have young. Who has measured the waters in the hollows of his hand or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? And you know the answer to all these questions. There's no God besides our God. Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills on a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him in the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. With whom will you compare God? 
To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They look for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Verse 21, do you not know? Have you not heard? Hasn't it been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understand since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught. He reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, that he blows on them. He just blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the story host one by one and calls them each and calls forth each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength not one of them is missing wow can somebody say amen, amen. thank you wow and it's, it all started with this is your God this is your God people And then there's a shift in verse 27. Isaiah does something and, you know, the way he writes it is, is a big shift from where we just read. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded disregarded by God. The people of Israel were struggling to believe that God cared because they were in exile. They were, they were exiled. They were away from their home, from Jerusalem, from the place they knew. And I think that maybe some of this is where you are today, where I am today. Maybe you're wondering why God seems so far off. Maybe you're in your own kind of exile. Let me continue to read in verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. The majority of this passage, Israel has been given a reminder and a picture of the indescribable ability and knowledge and wisdom of their God, of our God. For the previous 39 chapters, they had been told that judgment was coming. And then in chapter 40, and then chapter 40 begins with a picture of grace and mercy and comfort. It's a picture of a God who desperately, desperately wants his people to turn back to him. And when they do turn back, what's the result? The answer is
I will give you strength. You know, it's pretty logical how God and Isaiah did this, right? This section that I just read began with, here's your God. And in order to trust these promises in that section, you have to know who you're trusting. So it makes sense that the, the strong one is the one who gives the strength. The, the one who can comfort gives comfort. It was strength and power that Israel needed. They were desperate. They were exiled. They were hurting. They were lonely, worried. They were tired. They were weary. Really tired. We will grow tired and weary too. Every pro every, you know, some people are guilty. I, I was. I've said it before. Every promise in the book is mine. Well, here's a promise for you. You're going to get tired. You're going to get weary. You're going to fall. You can count on those promises. Mm. Ouch. Ouch. Thank you. Ouch. No matter how thick our skin is, spiritually speaking, no matter how high your pain threshold is, I wish Art was here, no matter how confident we are in our own abilities, every one of us has a breaking point. Maybe that's how God wants it. Maybe God is speaking to you right now. You feel like you're in exile. You're not alone. Not alone. Even those in Scripture, you know, we all have our heroes in Scripture. Paul, David, for me, those two. Um, but, you know, we felt like the greatest men and women of, the, of faith in the Bible... You know, we're, wow, but if you read, you find out that they ran out of strength too. They fell too. They hurt as well. When this text was written, you know, for example, everyone in that generation, in that age, knew the great kingdom of Babylon would last forever. But it didn't. It's gone. Babylon's long gone. We will run out of strength, but God gives an opportunity to us for renewal. He says to us, just like he said then, hope in me. Wait in me. I don't lose strength. And I will renew yours. Right? I don't lose strength and I will renew yours. This promise of assurance is applicable to us because you know there's certain things in scripture as you know when you properly exegete scripture you can't say I'm going to take that promise because it's not mine it's not yours to take thank God there's some that we don't want but we have to properly look at it but this one is a general it's it's applicable to the people of Israel but it's applicable to all of God's people over all time that he will renew our strength but we can read and reread this text and still feel lost in the hopelessness of our situation, right? And let me make the tension in this uh, text at the, at the end here uh, a little thicker. The Hebrew word for hope in, kava, is interesting. As many Hebrew words are, they usually have dual or even more meanings. This one means wait, but it, but it, and, and that wait has a connotation of waiting on God and hoping in God and looking to God. It has all that in it, but it also holds a meaning of not being passive. It can mean strengthen with God, but this is also what it means. Wait. Be patient not passive. It's okay, Christian, to do something. Don't force it, but don't be passive either. This is what this teaches us. It almost seems like they're in conflict. Pastor Kevin, I don't know. Wait a minute. Come on, help me out. L let me try. I was reading about uh, a, a pastor in Southern California and his son, who's also a pastor. And uh, the, the, older, the father uh, 
called his son and then texted his son and you know some communications but eventually basically he said this hey son there's a spot on my lungs and uh, the diagnosis is that it's cancer and it's not going to kill me anytime soon it is going to kill me but not anytime soon it's terminal but it isn't going to happen right away and and his son said well, wait dad wait a minute Tell, explain this to me again I, I want to call your doctor I want to get a better answer to this he's going no it's treatable it's not curable but I just have to deal with it and his son who's a young pastor said and you're okay with that and he said yeah I'm okay with that the diagnosis basically was a lifetime of waiting with this thing in his lungs it kind of reminded my of my sister who's dealing with her own daughter who has uh, dementia and some other issues that don't look like they're getting cured it's just something they're gonna have to live with a lifetime of waiting now this pastor this elder pastor and his wife have lived with this truth of waiting on God and they are okay they are living Isaiah 40 they have faced difficulties like you and I do you know we go from one uh, issue to another we God fixes this for us and we find another one you know it, it just happens and God says trust me I'm gonna bring you through the next one we can push and argue with doctors and our children and our spouses and we can demand that they do this or do that but will it get us anywhere really or should we be patient like this pastor and his wife we can stop and remind ourselves who is really in control of all of this and be patient and trust the God who says in the next chapter of Isaiah chapter 41 for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you do not fear I will help you I have to remind myself that God has always been this God and he will always be that God and he will always be near enough to me to take my hand that's how much God loves me I don't know about you but that does something for me it doesn't mean that we take whatever situation we're in lightly right we need to pray hard for people who are hurting we need to come to church early and 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 meet the God at the, at the intersection between heaven and this place but what can we do besides trust in God when those situations rise and arise and arise we I, I'll just tell you about me I believe that God is God and that God is good and I believe that God is God and God is good even if that job situation is crazier than ever even if your health doesn't improve even if that rebellious child grows further and further away from your God God is God and God is good and let me tell you this thing about uh, those difficult situations it seems so simple but please realize and the, the, the people of Israel didn't realize it and that's why I'm bringing it up please realize that no matter how difficult your situation is it doesn't change God's proximity to you God is still very near to you he still walks with you and he still holds your hand well Pastor Kevin how can you believe that well in Isaiah the people of Israel felt that God was distant from them because they were in exile they thought God was back in the temple location a thousand kilometers away they put the eternal God 
the God who can't be confined into a temporary structure that fell at the hands of the Babylonians. <clears throat> you and I have to avoid doing the same thing. In our circumstances, we must believe that God is God and God is still good, no matter what. I think, and I borrow this from a, a pastor friend, we have to have patient anticipation because we know that the eternal God is victorious in the end. Patient anticipation. Now here's an exercise that I'm going to try. I don't know how long I'll be able to do it, <coughs> but I'm going to try it. And I think it'll help me. I need to write down through, you know, I'm pretty old now. I had a birthday recently, so I'm pretty old. So I have a lot of experience. Of, I got saved when I was 19, so from 19 until now, you know, 39, 40, somewhere around there, I can't remember. But all the times that God helped me during a very difficult situation and how, what, how God came through or how he got me through, right? I, I want to write that down. So, and I'm going to do it with a real pen and paper. So, it might be something you want to try. And here's what this pastor's wife, this pastor with cancer down in Southern California. I haven't gotten this guy's permission to, to tell you this. That's why I'm not mentioning his name. But um, <clears throat> what his wife is doing is she's on uh, social media. She's on Instagram and um, maybe Line. Uh, I know Instagram and... Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. That's the one. She's on those two. I don't do uh, Twitter. I do a little Instagram, but I don't do Twitter, so I can't remember it. But what she's doing is she's uh, uploading pictures and a little scripture here and there and telling about her husband's progress and condition and you know, how he's, he's working to change his diet a little bit to, to you know, for this long, a lifetime of waiting on God, right? And she um, tags every post with um, do I put it up there? I don't think I put it up there. No. Yes, this is it. With this. In Psalm 4610. She tags this. This is the premise for a lifetime of Christian waiting. Right? This is the biblical premise for waiting on God. Be still and know that I'm God. Now, now you got it? You got it? Now let me, let me give you another one. Being still is not the same thing as doing nothing. Okay? Okay? This is the other side of the word kava. Patient, not passive. Listen, God is very clear about certain things that we can do and should not do. And I've found in my life, and I'm sorry, in the lives of others too, too often we Christ followers sit around waiting on God to do something great, but refuse to take some initiative to do what God wants us to do. Too often we would rather pray than obey. Can I get an ouch? Too often we would rather pray than obey. It's like we want to negotiate with God. Like my four-year-old granddaughter did yesterday when she came over to our house with her mom. She does it more when she comes with her mom. She does it less when she comes with her mom and her dad. But this is what she, did. she does. She gets a few toys out and she scatters them all over the room. And then she goes in my wife's drawers in the kitchen and she pulls out these little pretty th like cups that you bake with, you know, and they're pretty. And, they're colorful and she lines them up and she puts them on the table, on the floor, on the sofa, on the sideboard. And her mother says, Michael, it's time to go. Pick up the stuff and put it away. Oh, Mom, I want to negotiate with you. Five more minutes. Wait, wait, let me, let me get the TV remote control. I want to watch one more TV program. Mom, let's stay one more time. And she never gets to picking up the stuff. Kind of reminds me of how I try to negotiate with God. I don't want to obey right away. I kind of want to do 
what I want to do and I negotiate and I said well God you know pretty tired today and I you know I sent an email to a friend and he didn't answer me so you know still gonna be pretty angry at him we need to stop trying to negotiate with God and just do what he's asking us for example we never have to pray about whether we should forgive someone. We never have to pray about whether we should love our neighbor. We never have to pray about whether we should mess with witchcraft. We never have to pray about whether we should compromise our relationship with Jesus Christ just to get something that we want. Are you listening to Pastor Chris's messages on Revelation? Witchcraft, basically, compromising our walk with Christ to get something that we want right now. There's so many things we can do that we don't have to wait for an answer to do. We just need to obey. Waiting means we are patient, not passive. It means we trust Him in our exile. Actually, you know, just think about it. Exile is God's classroom. When does God teach you great truths about Himself and His Word? When things are going great or when things are falling apart? Now, <clears throat> okay, this has been a message almost entirely for Christ followers. So, I want you to know this. If, if you're here today and you aren't a follower of Christ, know this. God brought you here today to hear of His love and comfort that is available to you. We started at the end of the chapter. We went back to the beginning of the chapter. We're back at the end now. And I'm going to go back to verses 1 and 2 and read again. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This is a kind of prophetic statement of God saying, Comfort my people. Their sins have been paid for. Christ has done the hard work on the cross. God will give you double. He will give you His grace. He will give you His mercy. He will give you His salvation. He will give you eternity if you put your trust in Him. God loves man so much that He provided a way for our sins. The very, the very thing that keeps us in exile from God if you're an unbeliever. That can be taken care of as we put our faith in, in Jesus Christ. He sent Jesus Christ to die on a lonely cross in our place. When Christ rose from the dead, He made a way for you, for you to be forgiven and become a Christ follower. If you believe this today, you, be, you can begin to work, walk with this eternal God who we've been talking about today. He'll take care of your circumstances, but first, He wants to take care of your sin circumstance. Jesus died and rose from the grave so that you could have eternal life no matter what your circumstances are. We can't go to him and say, God will take care of my circumstances, then I'll believe. No. He says, come to me. Come to me. You know, put your stuff back there. Give me your heart. Give me your life. And we'll deal with those circumstances next. God is greater than your greatest enemy, which is sin and death. Jesus took care of it on the cross and when he rose from the dead. Okay, let's wrap this up. God wants us to remind ourselves that God is bigger than our greatest fears. He can outlast our greatest frustrations. And because of those truths and because we know that God is God and that God is good, we can actively follow him and trust in the wisdom he gives to us for direction in our lives. Maybe we need to be pr brave enough to pray, God, 
will you teach me to wait? God, will you teach me to wait? My hope and prayer is that this week we will take this chapter to heart, read it again, and that we will wait, begin to learn to wait on the good, on our good and eternal God. God is good all the time. Now, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear, I was glad to hear Grace talk about the King James Version. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to close with the King James Version, but pretty close. The New King James Version is my last text. Now, you want, might want to take a picture of this because when I use the New King James Version, it's, it's something that, you know, like it happens once every 100 years or something, so. And I, I chose this because it's just, it's good. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the Lord, living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we just do not like waiting. We don't like being in exile and we feel like you are so far away when we are going through uh, difficult things. But thank you, Father, that you are God all the time and that you are good all the time. No matter what we're going through, you're always right there with us. You are a paraclete. You're right beside us, you're in us, you're all around us. And you take hold of our right hand. Father, we are hurting, we're desperate, and that might be exactly where you want us to be. So we can only reach out to you. Father, help us to wait, help us to be of good courage, help us to trust that you will strengthen our heart. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody said? Amen. Okay. Thank you.